ships around was what the whales went through, what it meant to them, how they were traumatized. And they, they still used their wits, they still tried to escape, they, and they had been since the capture started about five years earlier to uh, send out decoys, try to divert the capture boats. And that's why they had to use aircraft so they could survey a big area and catch them that were down for 10 or 15 minutes with their babies to try to get away out of sight. But that's what happened and they found them. So they were as smart about it as they could be. Orcas have a thing about them that is a bunch of things that are important to know that are they're pretty much unheard of in wildlife biology. For one, they've never had predators. They're the top, top predator in the ocean. They've never had that adrenaline, gotta fight, gotta run, or just freeze. They, they don't have that. And they're pretty quick about remembering and knowing what's going on. So after the first capture, the, the capture teams had to change the engines in their boats, or new boats, because when they heard that boat, they'd run, they'd, they'd be gone. So they're just, they were very smart about it, and in this case, in August 1970, they were spotted somewhere, uh, maybe off the San Juans, but all of them, and at that time nobody had done any kind of, you know, population survey, but estimates are around a hundred of them in JKNL pods, and they were having what they've had so few of in recent years, because it's a big social event, it's a big get-together, it's like a a barn dance or something. All the neighbors, all the relatives, the whole clan, the entire extended family for miles around comes together and they celebrate. I mean, you can see it and you can hear it. If you put hydrophones in the water, you can hear all the chatter. It's like, uh, you know, uh, dozens of parties going on at once. It's great to see, and they mix and mingle, and what I've noticed is that they seem to sort of uh, systematically uh, meet everybody, because, you know, they're different pods, sometimes different matrilines, subpods within the pods. They may be separated for months at a time, but when they get together, you know, they're, they greet each other. They're, they're just, you can see that they're happy to be together. And they have certain, well, there's a kind of a ritual called a greeting ceremony to start it off, where the pods come together and they form kind of a big triangle in their pod formation with their matrilines lines side by side, the mother, grandmother, great grandmother, uh, with all of her generations arrayed right around her and all the pods together and they meet each other and I've seen this back in the in the 80s and they, they form a kind of a big triangle and they then you know af after they've sort of done that that big greeting moment where they're all facing each other they dive and they kind of meet in the middle and then they kind of meet all over the place and there's all these groups where they're kind of rolling around each other and, and across pod so you'll have members of J pod greeting K pod and L pod and and every combination so it's a real you know good to see you re reaffirm our bonds, our, our family ties, and uh, you know, I don't know what they can tell each other about where they've been. I don't know, but they're just they're celebrating their togetherness. Togetherness is their home. They don't have 
dens, caves, you know, any place that they all know to come back to, they come back to each other. And so that's what they were doing. They were having that celebration, that greeting ceremony, and it could go on for days. And it, as I saw it, happens most often off the south end of San Juan Island, out on some salmon banks, uh, and, you know, sure, they're grabbing a, a snack everywhere they go, but it's a good place to have a whole lot of, you know, finger food around if you're a whale, <laughs> if you have fingers. But, you know, they would just grab a snack while they're at the party. And that's when they got caught. Somebody saw them out there. The, the speed boats, they're, they were, you know, good sized cruisers, but they were fast. They had big boats. And they knew how to hurt them, and that's with bombs. Cherry bombs, or seal bombs, as they're called. And they had torches on board with that flame and lighting those bombs and tossing them in the water. Well, those, those are ear splitting. I mean, literally, their eardrums can be fractured from that. They are so sensitive to sound in the water. So they have no choice. It's instant pain. They have to run, get away from that sound. So they apparently herded them all the way down to the south end of Whidbey Island. And their intention, according to the book by one of the team, Ted Griffin, was to get them into Holmes Harbor, which is about 15, 20 miles south of here on the east side of Whidbey Island. And they thought that'd be the perfect spot. But because the whales did that decoy technique, uh, they got by that. And once the boats caught up with them after being seen by the aircraft, they were, at, they were here. They were off Penn Cove. So then they circled them and pushed them into Penn Cove. So they came in this way. Imagine all these speedboats throwing bombs and all of these extremely agitated. They knew, they knew their young ones were going to be taken, stolen. That never happens in their world. Their young are there together with their family their whole lives. Adults, male and female, with their moms, with their grandma, all the time, their entire lives, it's their, it's their home, is each other. And they knew, because they'd been through it for about five years. They're going to take some of us. They're going to take our young ones. So they were, they were, I, I don't know if an orca can be panicked, but they were distraught, to say the least. So they were pushed in with those bombs, and the Pursainers followed. They could draw quarter mile nets. And that's what they did. They netted off the opening to Penn Cove, and then they went to work building the corrals right about here, right about where we are right now. and brought in their gear, the big nets, the big noose, and went to work with divers and teams on small boats. I'm talking 10, 12 foot little rowboats. Once they had them inside those little corrals, they went around and herded them further. Then they had to separate the moms from the babies. And you know, those orcas could have had their lunch any time. They aren't called killer whales for nothing. They're totally capable, but they didn't. It's not in their repertoire. It's not in their traditional behavior. They've never done that. And they weren't gonna start then. It's only after extreme deprivation 
of everything, of family, of life, of world in captivity, that some of them tip over the edge and go on the attack, can be pushed to that. But these were still part of their family, part of their culture, part of their ancient traditions. You don't attack humans. So they didn't. So they could be separated. So the moms were pushed out. The babies were lassoed with these big hoops on the end of big poles. The baby came by, they'd swing it across their heads, tighten it. And then a whole bunch of guys on those wooden floats would pull them in, wrap them up tight, and lift them up onto a carrier boat, onto a deck of a boat that was then taken to that dock right there. It's called San De Fuca. It's pretty much the same as it was then. The wooden dock came out. I think it was a, a fuel stop back then. But they were able to get flatbed trucks. You know, 30 foot flatbed trucks or not even that. And just put those baby orcas on the trucks. Haul them away. They went down to holding pens in Seattle while the capture teams went over there to the Captain Whidbey. That's where they stayed. That was their base of operations and that's where their phone was. And from there they called every prospective buyer they could around the world. I mean, we're talking Hong Kong, Germany, South America, of course, SeaWorld. SeaWorld had just, in 1966, gotten their very first whale, a southern resident. They named Shamu. So they were eager for more. They were expanding, building new tanks. So they wanted more. Everybody wanted more. So they sold as many as they could. They got seven from here in August 1970. And they devastated the southern residents. Another probably five, I think three babies and two mamas drowned and died in that. They tried to get back together, and so they got wrapped up in those nets, and they couldn't get up to breathe. And that was only, that was the worst. That, that was the most that were taken over that. It was actually from 65 to 73, and then they captured some more after that that were transients. Nobody knew that at the time. They didn't know a resident from a transient, but as the records show, those were transients, and they never were able to take. They did corral, surround some residents. Uh, Victoria capture teams did that, but they didn't end up taking any. So it was those eight years and 1970 was a peak of it. Then a year later, they did it again in Penn Cove, 1971, another roundup, and they pushed them in. They only picked out three that time. But this was the scene of the tragedy for the whales. That's what they didn't see, didn't want to see, didn't admit. And there were people lined up. We have photos, DFW photos. Traffic was stopped on Highway 20. There were people lined up all over the bluffs watching this happen. 
we hear stories about the screaming. The whales were vocalizing so loud above and below that they were being heard all around. And once they had those corrals and once they had the mamas and babies and then even just the babies when they were able to push the moms out, none of the others left. They couldn't. They took down the seine nets. They could have left a week or two before they did. It took about two weeks for the whole thing to unfold. And all of them stayed here. They could have left. But as long as they knew one of their family was trapped but still in communication, still in the water, nobody left. But once that last one left, we don't know if that was Tokite or not. They slowly turned and left. a diver named John Crow who was in his teens or early 20s and he was hired sort of glamorous you know a new challenge a new adventure to be a part of that team so he was out here and he did his job but he saw all this and it did touch him he did feel it he had to do his job, but he said it was the worst thing he's ever done or ever seen. And he's been through wars since then. But it tore him up so much that he got in touch. Once we started this campaign on a shoestring in 1995, Somehow he heard about it living in Newport, Oregon and said, I was there and if there's anything I can do to help bring her home, you let me know. So in 1998, I was in Miami. I lived in Miami two years to try to get some support in Miami. So Susan, my partner in all this, uh, started these annual commemorations as 20 years ago today and so he came up John Crow came up and told his story and he I've seen him talk a few times since then he's passed away a few years ago became a very, very close friend. But he starts talking by, you want to see a grown man cry? Because it hits him every time. So, this is, this is where it happened. And, you know, we've been trying to you know, keep it on the positive, and we have. You know, I mean, back then, in the mid-90s, nobody really thought that much. There were a few. I mean, there were some things happening. There had been already a movement in the UK to stop the whole captivity business there, and they did it in the early 90s. They made the regulation so stringent that none of the captivity places could afford to build the tanks that they required, so they just had to shut down. So there were people, but still a minority. But over the years, and it's not just us, it's a whole big team of people that have been campaigning, reaching out, and a lot of journalists, a lot of media, 
I mean, when they look at it, if they're sensitive humans at all, 